Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the fifth day of November in the year of our Lord, 2023. And I, I have to speak some more about the atrocity that is going on in the land of Palestine today. And I'm no longer going to call it the land of Israel because, well, there's a problem with calling it that. I've come, over the last month, I've come to some conclusions. Uh, like many, I was shocked by what happened on October 7th, and as I looked into it and began to read about the background, what had been going on in Israel uh, in that period of time leading up to that, I came to some definite conclusions. And over the last four weeks, as more and more information has become available, mostly from Israeli sources, including uh, government-supplied uh, uh, video, drone footage, photographs of the aftermath of October 7th, uh, gov Israeli government supplied. I've come to some more conclusions. And as I've heard more and more other people uh, that have come to the same conclusions as I have. <sighs> and I'd like to uh, and then also what is the ongoing problem there in the Middle East? Who is the ongoing problem there in the land of Palestine? Why is there no peace in the land of Palestine? Okay, first of all, I want to state, based on what I've seen and looked at, what's publicly available, that Hamas is not a terrorist organization. Hamas is not a militant organization. Hamas is a legitimate elected government of Gaza. They supply uh, and they, they serve all the functions of government, including trying to defend their citizens from enemy forces that have been waging a war of ethnic cleansing against the Palestinian people for over 75 years, even before uh, the, uh, the Zionist project became a state. And looking at the evidence of what actually took place on October 7th, I have rejected the Israeli narrative of that event and come to different conclusions. Uh, most of the civilians, if you can call Israelis of a particular age civilians, because they're all practically all connected to the Israeli military, uh, if not as active or what you might call active reserve, ready reserve, then they are um, still reserve up until the age of 45 or so. Uh, Israel's military is basically based on reserves, and a large reserve force, and a small active force, relatively small active force. And uh, so if you're between 18 and 45, or say 18 and 30 for more practical purposes, you are in the Israeli military. Uh, or most people are in the Israeli military in one sense or another, subject to call-up. Uh, what actually happened, from my opinion, what I've, the evidence I have been able to piece together on October 7th is, first of all, the Israeli government, the Netanyahu regime, or particular elements in that regime, if Netanyahu is probably not in complete control, staged a series of provocations on Alaska, the Temple Mount, uh, invading the, the holy place of the Muslims, the third most holy shrine in Islam, repeatedly with settlers uh, restricting, preventing Muslims from entering to worship except old men and women. And uh, what they did is laid 
claim to the Temple Mount. They were, in effect, saying this is our spot. We're going to build a temple here. We're going to worship here, and you're not going to worship here any longer. Symbolic claim to that is part of the Netanyahu regime's um, plan. They want a pure Judenstaat, a Jewish state. The uh, culmination of the Zionist product, project, the secular Zionist project, but they also want the culmination of a religious Zionist project, which is a pure religious Zionist state with a rebuilt temple. They want to rebuild the uh, temple of Herod, the second temple, so this would be the third temple, and return to a second temple Judaism with animal sacrifices and whatnot, I suppose. Uh, Reinstitute the... Uh, the sacrificial system of the Torah, the law of Moses, with all the necessary slaughter of oxen and sheep and goats and doves, the rivers of blood that entails from that system that is now obsolete because the Messiah has come and all those types and shadows are obsolete. I am a Christian, and unashamedly so. And the, the center law of Christianity is the law of love. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself, which is a direct quote of, from Jesus out of the Torah the law of Moses, to which Jesus also added, you shall love your enemies, which transcends the law of Moses and the Quran by infinite magnitude. To love your enemy is something unknown in either form of the worship of the one true God. So, uh, what happened on October 7th, from what I can piece together from the evidence, and it's quite obvious, to me at least, and to others, to growing numbers of others that have uh, more military and other knowledge than I have, but it's not difficult to put the pieces together. You simply look at the evidence and draw your conclusions from that. You don't necessarily listen to what people say, you look at what they did and what makes sense based on the, re the visible evidence that we're presented with. Of course, forensic evidence of the, the people killed during those events would be far more conclusive. You know, what caliber bullets are in the bodies or shrapnel is in the bodies, just like the, the explosion at the Baptist hospital where perhaps 500 people were killed in the compound, it's very simple to determine. Just ask the surgeons what they dug out of the people. It will identify what caused the deaths. The shrapnel, the shards, the remains of whatever weapon it was will identify the source. If it was launched from uh, elements inside Gaza, they should own up to the fact Truth is always a better policy than lies, because lies discredit you. Truth is always honorable. Lies are always dishonorable. This world does not understand that. The United States and the current administration in the United States do not understand that. We do not have an honorable president of the United States, nor an honorable president staff, nor an honorable Congress that is filled with dishonorable men who love lies. They are not to be trusted. They are not honorable men and women. They love money rather than loving the truth. And loving the truth is necessary to be saved from the wrath of God. Now, 
what I believe happened on uh, October 7th, it was instigated by uh, factions in the Israeli government. Perhaps Netanyahu himself was now, uh, or they all knew about it, but definitely uh, people like Ben Gavir were uh, very active in the instigations of provocations. And it's obvious that those provocations were not, no, not only to lay a claim to the Temple Mount, but to seeking to provoke a response that would allow Israel to continue on with its program of ethnic cleansing, which it has been engaged in since prior to 1948, even. So what happened? Uh, they succeeded in provoking Hamas, and Hamas launched a brilliant uh, military operation. I'm, no one could, could uh, say it wasn't brilliant that had any knowledge or were honest. And their purposes, apparently, as far as what I can discern, were twofold. One, to strike at the, the military police infrastructure that had been their jailers for 56 years in Gaza, especially since uh, 2006, I believe it was, or something like that, when Sharon did the so-called pullout uh, and just walled the whole thing in, make it, made it into a walled prison. So there was an operation to strike at uh, the military installations around Gaza, including the settlements. I want to let let everybody in the world know that kibbutzim, um, Jewish settlements, from prior, from all the way back to the beginning of the 20th century, they had not only a agricultural purpose as a farming community but a military purpose as a colonizing outpost, an armed outpost, a defensible outpost, as part of the process of colonizing the land, taking control over an area, just like the, the same way, um, say, English kings used castles. They would build a castle in a hostile area and use the power of that castle to extend their control over increasing areas of land. And that's what the purpose of kibbutzim is, too. It's, uh, uh, in far as if there's an invasion, they are the first line of defense. They are tasked with the responsibility of delaying the enemy forces until Israel can mobilize its reserves and respond. So those are legitimate military targets. They are not helpless villages, they are armed settlements. And if you looked at them on Google Earth, they look like armed fortifications with fences, perimeter roads, all the things you would have if you wished to uh, have a defensive or offensive location, uh, a strong point for the Zionist project. So what Hamas did, as far as I can discern, was reasonable, given the circumstances. Were there things done that ideally wouldn't have been done? Were there people perhaps murdered? Were there? I have not seen any evidence of intentional murder. I've read reports of vehicles that were... Um, open fired on, and I I wouldn't be surprised if there weren't cases where Hamas uh, military or Hamas or sympathizers that were out there in this operation uh, shot people uh, just to kill them. That's possible, certainly. But the evidence I've seen, uh, and you look at uh, Herat Herat's newspaper has a list a an, an ex of the all the people that have kill, been killed, the uh, Israelis, since uh, that are publicly available at least, some 1,000 of them now uh, since October 7th. And most of the civilians, again, tend to be lo young people, so civilian is not really a proper designation in Israel of those people. Israelis of that age are almost always connected with the military, either as active or reserves. So what happened was apparently it was, was not a deliberate target. The location of that uh, uh, 
party, Woodstock, music festival, whatever you want to call it, was not known in advance. It was put out at the last minute. The organizers actually had to find a different location. And uh, Raim, uh, the Raim uh, agricultural area there, uh, sort of a park-type area too, was uh, a sort of a last-minute choice. And uh, certainly Hamas did not know about it. What apparently happened there, uh, the videos we see, the videos of, of the young people, the Israelis fleeing, and Hamas snatching some up. And there's gunfire in the background. There is prob uh, what I would say is probably AK-47 gunfire. I, I'm not terribly familiar with the sound of that weapon, but I know the sound of other weapons, like uh, uh, M-16 or something like that, and that's not what was there. So it's probably... Uh, uh, you know, I've heard them on occasion, but it would be consistent with an AK-47, the sounds I've heard. I definitely know what a rifle sounds like. Uh, but, uh, yeah, they have sort of a unique sound, too. But th that's small arms fire. What I heard in the background as these uh, young people were fleeing across the field. Why were they fleeing across the field? Because they couldn't get out. Their vehicles were blocked in. Uh, the exit was jammed up. And uh, some of them were fleeing in their vehicles down the highway. Uh, and others uh, had to abandon their cars and begin to flee on foot. And the Hamas, a relatively small number, actually, they, they actually attacked from two vectors. No, excuse me, I'm getting confused with something else. They, they came in mostly by air there. They may have come in some—oh, no, some came in by ground, too, because they were on, on motorcycles, small motorcycles. So. And one of their purposes was— uh, obviously, the, the purposes of this mission, this operation, was twofold, to strike at military, civilian military installations that were used uh, for the colonization of the land and uh, used to suppress the people, oppress the people in Gaza. And the second one, legitimate military targets. These were legitimate targets. And the other thing is to take hostages. And the reason that Hamas wanted the hostages is not to terrorize, but because Israel is holding over 7,000 Palestinians in detention, imprisoned uh, without uh, proper charge. Uh, they also have what they call administrative detention. In other words, you're simply imprisoned without any charge at all because they want to. Say, only Jews have rights in Israel. If you're not Jewish, you don't have any real rights. You're not even second class. You're like third class. And the Palestinians, well, I think their, their biggest crime other than being not Jews is they remind the Jewish population of their evil deeds. They're a reminder of how bad uh, the Zionist project is, how evil it is, that they stole these people's land. So you don't want to be reminded of that. So you want to get rid of them because they remind you of the evil deeds you've done and your ancestors have done. Get rid of the guilt by getting rid of the reminder of your deeds. I suspect that's part of the motivation. But Hamas uh, actually did a number of brilliant maneuvers. They, they captured a fairly large military base uh, just north of the Gaza Wall, uh, about um, less than two kilometers, and they launched a seaborne assault and a land assault on that and took it in less than an hour. And most of the Israeli troops there, who mostly were, were recruits in basic training, fled. Fled, fled. So the, the ones that were willing to make a stand were quickly overwhelmed. Uh, these are milit these are soldiers. They're, this is war. If you're out there with a gun, you're a target, a legitimate target. In the uh, kibbutzim that around there was, there was one. I can't remember the name of it right now. Zikim was right by this base that was. Uh, what it was something number four? It's not labeled on Wikipedia on uh, Google Earth. The, the military bases don't have names on them. Other maps, they, there are some labels available, <laughs> but uh, th these these 
kibbutz, kibbutzim, uh, like the Zakim there that was at Zakim Beach. Look at the Battle of Zakim. These are all the the Israeli narrative of these struggles on October 7th, uh, battles on October 7th, are available on Wikipedia now, the Israeli version. Not a objective version, the Israeli version. The Israeli narrative is available. So if you look at their narrative and fit things together, it comes, it comes obvious what happened. Now, looking at pictures, you see smash vehicles, uh, houses burned out, uh, a tank, obviously high caliber, hot, heavy weapon hits in the wall. You know, you got a, a hole several feet in diameter in a uh, concrete house. Uh, well, that was not a light, that was not an assault rifle. <laughs> assault rifles don't go through structures like that. Uh, those, those kind of impacts are it's obvious. It's easy to tell the difference. Just a simple inspection. You look at it. Yeah, that's what that came from, and that's what that came from. So what happened at Raim, uh, my best uh, analysis of it is the Israeli, uh, the Israeli military were overwhelmed. They were overrun. They went into a panic. There was a breakdown in the chain of command. Uh, a lot of the people that were supposed to be around Gaza had actually been moved to the West Bank, I believe, in anticipation of difficulties there. And so in the panic, they resorted to indiscriminate action, violence, using heavy weapons, because they were no match for the Hamas military wing. And that's what they were. They're a military wing, a very good one, apparently. So in the panic, well, there, there, I, there, there was, there's a movie that was back in the 60s, a piece of United States military propaganda called The Green Berets with, uh, uh, what was his name, uh, John Wayne. And one of the final scenes in there, the, the, uh, the fire base, the military fire base, which is like sort of like a kibbutz in a way, uh, came up, was overwhelmed and overrun by uh, the Vietnamese. Uh, in this case, I think it was the uh, Viet Cong. And they called in uh, a gunship called Puff the Magic Dragon uh, with 20-millimeter uh, Gatling guns and just sprayed the entire base with that, killing every living thing there. And that's about the reaction, you know, in the... And the, the movie, uh, John, uh, John Wayne says, where do you want, they, they contact him, where do you want us to lay the fire? And said, on the base, they have it, not us. And that's sort of the reaction, uh, a metaphor of the reaction the Israelis probably had. They were terrified, they were confused, they didn't know what was going on, they had no, uh, the chain of command was broken, and uh, had no idea what was really going on. So possibly without order or with orders, they were just told to stop Hamas, regardless of the cost, regardless of loss of life. And that's what they did. That's what the evidence illustrates. At Raim, it's pretty plain to me that uh, probably several AH-64 Apache gunships, Apache attack helicopters, came in and strafed the highway uh, and the cars that were fleeing from the re region and just devastated them. The, the road is covered with spots where the ve you could see there were vehicles that burned on the road. That's a pretty obvious thing to see. If you ever seen where a car burned off up, up along the highway? Yeah, it's pretty, you can tell, ah, a car burned there. Um, and uh, vehicles that were pushed off to the side, um, so it was sort of cleaned up already, but uh, both sides of the road, the grass had all been burned from fires. So these attack helicopters are equipped with a 30-millimeter chain gun, which is an automatic cannon. 
It's able to not only destroy cars, it can destroy armored vehicles. Uh, uh, it's commonly used for that. They are also equipped with Hellfire missiles, typically four on a side, and they're equipped with uh, two pods of typically of uh, unguided two and three quarter inch diameter rockets, sort of a form of artillery. So they generally fire uh, those pods. They can fire them all at once and just spray a whole area with high explosive rockets. And they're devastating to things like vehicles and people, too. So that was what I believe happened there. The helicopters came in and, and shot up the... Uh, I, I'm going to say it wasn't intentionally to kill Israelis, but friendly fire in the fog of war and a breakdown in the chain of command and a panic, largely a panic, because is the vaunted Israeli military who had known nothing but victory, essentially, uh, in their, well, in their lifetimes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. See, I, I can remember I was 12 years old in 1967, so I, I can actually remember some of the news reports of that. Um, 56 was a little bit, I was not quite old enough to remember that, but I was around. Uh, anyway, that's what I believe happened. And the, evi the, visual, the visible evidence, is the Israeli supplied drone footage, uh, the, the wreckage, all demonstrates that's what happened. It was air aircraft, uh, helicopters. It's obvious that's what it was. It was helicopters. That's the kind of damage they do. So they shot up the fleeing vehicles that had Israelis in them. And uh, the, uh, the, the hostages that were taken were taken back to Gaza uh, to exchange for prisoners, which you may think that's not right, but if Israel is holding 7,000 Palestinians and you know you can exchange a couple hundred hostages for 7,000 Palestinians— it is not an irrational thing, if the, and the testimony of those that have been released is that we, we were well treated. Uh, they, they, some of them were said we were terrified, but they tried to calm us down. Said we're not going to kill you, and we're not going to kill you. Uh, I, Hamas is not a terrorist organization. They are not ISIS. They are not like ISIS at all. They are resistance movement trying to liberate their homeland from those who came in and stole it, from occupied it. That's the history of this place. And it's not unreasonable. It's not illegal to do this, whether it's hostages. Again, they were. what were they taken for? To exchange for the thousands that Israel holds. And a lot of the people that have hostages detained now are saying, yeah, all for all, all of your our hostages for all of their hostages. All the Israelis, uh, the, the uh, Palestinians in prison and detention, release them all. Yeah, that was the idea. Get some leverage so they could get another hostage exchange. Because Israel will never release them otherwise. Never. What are you going to do? Go to Israeli courts? The army just ignores the courts anyway. Netanyahu doesn't care what the court is. The, the justice system has been totally rigged by Netanyahu now, so he's basically, him and his party is a, uh, has absolute power. Unless the Israeli people rise up and, and topple him, go on general strike or something. But uh, I don't see anything like that happening right now. Because they've been sold lies all their life, too. Just like I was in the United States. The, the entire knowledge of Israel that I had until I went over there in 1985 and saw that one epi uh, incident of collective punishment in person, I had this, there was this whole mythology that was presented in the United States by major movie companies that had this myth of the, the history of Israel that was utterly one-sided and denigrated the actual Palestinians whose land it was. There was Israel has no valid claim or claim to that land at all, either biblically or the League of Nations had no right. 
the United Nations had no right and the British had no right to take that property without permission of those who had it and give it to others. It is the people that lived on there for generations. It is theirs, and without their consent, no one has a right to take that from them and give it to others, to drive them from their own land. There is no right to do that. There is no basis to do that justly without consent. And they did not give consent nor did the surrounding uh, Arab nations give consent. They rejected the partition plan, and rightly so, because it was unjust to the Palestinians. Unjust. So uh, I'm not going to call Hamas a terrorist organization or a militant organization. They are the legitimate government of Gaza, and I think they acted in under the circumstances and the deliberate provocations and the history of Israel in a reasonable manner. What else could they do? What else could they do and be a proper government if they did not respond to what Israel has been doing? And as far as their rocket attacks, those rockets they produce in Gaza are militarily ineffective. They are inaccurate and... Uh, <laughs> simply uh, a civil war field gun is more dangerous than those things, uh, more accurate than those things. But all they are is basically, I think, as far as the use of them, is to remind the Israelis every once in a while that we're still here, regardless of all your attempts to make us disappear, we are still here. So they fire some rockets, and they almost always are taken down it with, by Iron Dome if, the, Dome if they actually endanger uh, structures. Uh, otherwise, they land out in the field, which is where most of them go. Those are basically just knocking on Israel's door, saying, we're still here. That's my opinion. I suspect some people out there agree with me. A lot of people out there are going to agree with what I'm saying, because it's right. It's right. And I don't have a particular axe to grind in this. I'm simply a Christian. And if I did not say these things, if I did not speak the truth about what I believe is going on there, then I wouldn't be a Christian. I would not be a follower of Jesus Christ. Because Christians have to love truth. And they have to love justice because God is truth and God is just. And he's also merciful. I don't want to see people die regardless. But this has been going on way too long. And people, they, we've been kept in the dark. Americans are ignorant of the truth because the powers that be want to keep us ignorant. All the time, in all kinds of ways. They want us to be ignorant. They want us to spend our time watching mindless entertainment and listening to garbage music and keeping ourselves doped up on illegal or illegal stuff because that's the way they prefer us. Docile, quiet, and stoned. Serves their interests. They want us dependent on the government. So we vote for them mindlessly. They, they, they tax us and then give us tax rebates and call it, you know, and then say, aren't we wonderful? Vote for us again. Yeah. Or they borrow money and then give us benefits and say, aren't we wonderful? Vote for us, regardless of what the calamitous future is going to be. So uh, that's my take on... October 7th, uh, brilliant military maneuver, uh, brilliant operation, uh, absolutely stunning. <laughs> it certainly stunned the, the Israelis. Um, and reasonable operation, from what I can discern. And the Israeli military themselves is responsible for most of the civilian deaths. And the, 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 the people that were found burned in houses with their hands tied, yeah, 
Uh, Hamas had overrun. They had captured people. They were in the house. They tied up the, the hands of the occupants. And Israel came along and put a tank shell through the wall. And people died. And the building burned. And people were found dead with their hands tied because Hamas didn't murder them. Why would you tie up someone to murder them? And the IDF knows what really happened. And they're trying to cover their ass. That's what's happened. Because they don't want Israel and the world to know they're the ones that are responsible for those civilian deaths. But it's pretty obvious. This cover-up is falling apart already. Many people look at these, this evidence, these photographs and everything else, and say, huh, this isn't a small arms fire that did this. This is heavy weapons. This is helicopters. This is aircraft. This is tanks and artillery that did these things. It's obvious you can't hide the truth. This is in-your-face evidence. And again, you look at the bodies. Of course, Israel is going to cover all this up. They are not an open society. They are not. They don't have a free press in Israel. They have state censorship in Israel. They've always had state censorship in Israel. It has to. They can clamp down on everything in that country. It is not a free people. It is a militarized uh, society, which is the, a police society, which the United States is rapidly becoming too, if it hasn't already become that. Uh, uh, so this country has seriously declined over my lifetime, although it was never particularly good. Uh, I, you know, there was like in the 50s, there was uh, the McCarthy hearings. Uh, it's, and in the 60s, of course, the, the all the riots and the aftermath of the Civil War that never healed. Never People didn't allow it to heal. It became a, a, a business. <laughs> Different parties made uh, money off of promoting uh, injustice and promoting uh, racial strife. It was their power and their platform on both sides. And some of those people are still around today promoting the same things. They don't want peace because they make money off of strife and violence and war. United States, that's one of our biggest exports, apparently. Weapons. So on uh, Hamas, I think I covered that pretty well. Uh, you can look all this stuff up yourself. Wikipedia now has accounts of all the different uh, battles that were fought on the 7th, and it's one side, but you look at the pictures and think about it and look at the timeline and, aha, I know what happened. It's not hard to put these pieces together at all. You don't have to be a genius. You just have to have a little common sense and a little knowledge of history and a little knowledge of military and, boop, there you go. Uh, okay, what's... Uh, uh, The next thing I want to talk about is the persistent problem, why there cannot be peace in the Middle East, why there cannot be peace in Palestine. Because of the Zionist project. Zionism is an ideology. Originally, it was a secular ideology, a nationalist ideology. And now with uh, Netanyahu and his gathering of the worst elements, uh, the radical uh, right-wing religious elements, it has become a religious ideology, which is even more dangerous. Secularists, godless people um, are a little more flexible than people that believe they are acting in the name of God. Because a secularist is acting out of self-interest and a, a, a religious zealot is, believes he's acting in the name of God. There's a difference. There's a difference. ISIS is an example of religious, a religious ideology, an extremist religious ideology, an extremist interpretation of Islam. 
they are truly a terrorist ideology. S publicly beheading people slowly is the sole purpose of that is terror. Hamas is not ISIS. As the president of Turkey has said, Hamas is not ISIS, and I agree. Again, what I'd say to Hamas is, act th the, from the prophets, this is what I would say to Hamas and the Palestinians and everybody in the world. It is written in the prophets, what does God require of you except that you act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. The problem with the Zionist project that is called the State of Israel is it is inherently unjust in its creation. And the ideology itself, it's not simply the injustice of dispossessing a people of their land, their ancestral homeland, where they've lived for generations and moving other people in that come from a different continent. The Ashkenazi Jews, they don't, they, they have not lived, you know, it's been 2,000 years since there was a large Jewish population in Palestine. They were dispossessed many times by God, including in 70 AD and in 135. They waged two rebellions against the Roman Empire, and the Romans had it. And decided to rename Jerusalem and something else and build a pagan shrine where the temple was just to make it so that it would never be rebuilt. Plowed the entire temple mount. I've been there. I've seen the, thro the stones thrown down. Uh, the words of Jesus Christ were literally fulfilled in 70 AD when not one stone was left on another on the temple, the temple itself. The Wailing Wall or the Western Wall is a retaining wall that was put there by Herod the Great to expand the, the mount. And El Aska Mosque, the mosque properly, sits on the top of that uh, expanded platform that Herod built. The Dome of the Rock is to the north of that, and that is a shrine that marks the spot that was designated uh, that's, that represents where Mohammed took a mystical vision into heaven on a winged horse. Um, so that is, is the third holiest. The Dome of the Rock is the actual shrine. Uh, the mosque is to the south of it, built right on the edge of the temple or the expanded platform. Right above, in fact, the entranceway that's been sealed up where Jesus himself would have walked up the steps. Those steps are still there. I know, I've sat on them. I actually have a picture of myself sitting on him. Um, but, uh, and I realized when I was there in Israel that it doesn't matter where Jesus walked, it's where Jesus is now. It's following Jesus is not going where he was, it's going where he is. We're to follow him, not to make pilgrimages to where he once was. Uh, it's not really the point. But, uh, yeah, the, the whole Israeli Zionist project is incompatible with peaceful coexistence with other people. It just is. It's a supremacist ideology uh, with a supremacist Jewish identity in some form. It's not really, the original was not really religious. The current one seems to be religious. But it's still a Jewish identity where the uh, a, a pure Jewish state with where the Jews have special rights, not equal rights. And that's the problem, including the special right to dispossess others of their own land and move in, stealing their land, murdering them, and uh, lusting after their possessions. Three commandments broken right there. Uh, three of the ten, but there's a whole lot more than ten. Anyway, that's a problem. The, the ideology is not, uh, they're not looking for equality under common law, which would be a reasonable solution. Uh, the, the division 
plan of the United Nations was stupid. I mean, neither neither side there would have a viable state. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. It'd be like the Vatican. Is the Vatican a viable state? No, it's not even a viable city-state. Uh, it's just a silly little compound that has somehow is recognized by the United States as a nation. It's, it's not a nation. The Vatican is not a nation. It's a headquarters of a religious denomination is what it is. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you couldn't have a viable economy unless you had a lot of tourist trade there, which I'm sure they do. I'm sure there's a lot of vending of trinkets and stuff that goes on there uh, and indulgences. <laughs> They had their own sources of revenue, uh, generally referred to as swindling, uh, selling fake products to gullible people. But, uh, I mean, you can't. Uh, Gaza is not a viable entity. The West Bank is not a viable entity, especially when the two are not, uh, not connected together. Uh, is you, you have to have reasonable water sources. You have to have reasonable uh, access to the sea, if possible. Uh, it, it's pretty small to do much with. And most of the of even the land area of Palestine is, is desert. I see an awful lot of greenhouses uh, in even Gaza because of lack of water supply. So well, greenhouses are more efficient as far as water usage. Uh, the only major water source is the Jordan River and the Sea of Galilee, which the Jordan River is not a river. It is a stream. It is not what you would call a river. Uh, really, we have a river of the same size around here, the North Fork of the Vermilion River. Uh, this is, you know, almost any place. You have to find a place uh, to, to baptize somebody by immersion, you have to look for a deep spot in the Jordan. It's not a, a what you'd normally consider. A, it's, it's not a large river at all. It's, it's, it's a minor, you know, large stream at best. There's not a lot of water available. Uh, most of the water comes from outside the country, Mount Hermon to the north in Lebanon, I believe, or Syria, and to the north of Israel. Uh, the snow melt from that is a major water source. And there's a lot of people there dependent on that water. So that's another source of problems. Uh, the West Bank plan of Israel <clears throat> that's slowly eaten away at whatever's left of it, uh, nev they never were going to let uh, uh, the Palestinians have access to the Jordan River. Uh-uh. They were going to retain the strip uh, uh, in the Jordan Valley. That was, they were just going to, like the American Indian tribes, they were put on marginal land. And then when the land became worth something, they were moved off to other less useful land, smaller and smaller reservations. The United States has its own period of ethnic cleansing. But the difference is the American Indians have equal rights. They don't have to stay on the reservations. Israel still keeps the Palestinians on reservations. Some of them have citizenship. About 20% of the Israeli population is Arabs. So you have Christians and, and uh, Muslims that are citizens. They don't have equal rights. Many of the programs in Israel are not, uh, uh, they're not eligible because they're not Jews. It is a religious, political entity. It is, uh, and Jews have, are of high, have more importance than other people. It's, you look at how they treat the Palestinians. Look at how they treat the, the people in Gaza. That tells you exactly what the Israeli people can think about non-Jews in that country. They don't care about them dying. They don't. They don't want to see them. There's an attitude about that. And uh, 
if there wasn't that attitude, the Palestinians wouldn't be imprisoned in Gaza or in detention or being driven off the land in the West Bank. They're not regarded as fully human. Jews are a superior group. Just like in Ukraine, the uh, the powers that the United States put in place there as the rulers of the country had a similar ideology, the Banderites, followers of Stefan Bandera, who were allied with a certain Axis power from uh, Europe. And I'm not talking about Italy. The Japanese were the, had the same ideology, racial superiority. They were superior to everybody. Look at how the Japanese, well, there's plenty of videos on YouTube. You can educate yourself on all this stuff really quick. Uh, there are some videos by a, uh, an Israeli, uh, he's now a professor, I think, at, at, at Exeter in England. Uh, if that's England or Scotland, I don't know. Uh, what's his name? Pepe? that uh, wrote a book called The uh, the Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine. It's, I don't think it's available in print now, but it is available on audio and it's available on, on uh, a Kindle. I wrote a whole series of books on the history of the modern state of Israel and what happened to the indigenous populations. So, uh, my conclusion as far as uh, the state of Israel, uh, again, I think it was a foreign minister came out and said uh, not too long ago that e either you're with Israel or you're with Hamas. Well, I'm not with Israel. Let's put it that way. I'm, I'm not a supporter of Hamas. I'm, uh, I'm a Christian, uh, and uh, Hamas is not a Christian organization, but... I am not with Israel. No way. I'm, I'm not with genocide. Hamas isn't engaged in genocide. Hamas is not engaged in ethnic clean, uh, cleansing. Israel is doing these things in broad daylight in the sight of the entire world. And we see it. Even if uh, certain media, like YouTube, censors a lot of it uh, because it's too graphic, there's other sources like Rumble where you can see and uh, Telegram where you can see videos from cell phones, and you can see the actual results without it being hidden. You can see fathers digging their, their children, their little children, out of Israeli bomb craters. You can see fathers carrying their, their children off to the morgue. You can see people in, in Gaza that the fathers don't even have a shroud to wrap their dead children in. They're putting them in bags. See, in Islam, you're supposed to bury the dead within 24 hours, I believe, and they have a white shroud. It looks like a white sheet to wrap the body in, and you, you bury the body in the earth. Uh, and, and they can't do that. They can't do that. They don't even have a shroud for their own children. That is how bad it is. Not to mention they don't have water, they don't have food, they don't have medicine, they don't have power, they don't have fuel. Nothing to cook with. Even if they had food, they don't have to. And Israeli, the Israel, uh, Israel government is attacking every location of refuge. They're attacking hospitals. They're trying to drive the people out or, just, or kill them, just outright kill them. They can't drive them out. Uh, so they're, they're, they're targeting the population. This is not targeting Hamas. They are deliberately targeting the population. And if you've, if you've got them in a prison and you've cut off all the necessities of life, that is called extermination. That's a policy of genocide. That's a policy of extermination. And we're watching it happen before our eyes, people. This is unacceptable. And uh, the United States government now is complicit in this totally. It is no longer, you know, on October 7th, 
most Americans had no idea what's really going on there. We've had a month to dig, and all pretty much everybody's got access to the Internet. If you want to know, the truth is there. Even from Israeli historians and Israeli rabbis, from rabbis that, that, that condemn the ideology of Zionism, So I'm not talking about Jews in general at all. I'm talking about Zionism as incompatible with, a, with the modern world. It, they're not seeking to live at peace with others, with Palestinian Christians and Palestinian Muslims under a common law that all can consider just. They don't want that. They want special rights in a special ethnically cleansed state with a, a rebuilt temple. That's what they want now. That's what, that is the agenda of the current regime. And that is a reg, uh, an agenda for global conflict. There is one and a half billion Muslims in this world. Christians are not going to go to war over the Temple Mount at all, unless you're really a weird one. But Christian Zionists, repent. Educate yourself, repent. Just look up on YouTube. There's documentaries about what happened to the Christian Palestinians. If you care more for the Zionists than you do for your brothers and sisters in Christ, you're not a Christian because the prime directive of Jesus Christ to his people is love one another or love your brethren. He said that three times on the night before he was crucified. That was his instructions to his apostles. His disciples love one another, said it three times at the Last Supper. So if you're more uh, concerned about uh, uh, following the, the heretic John Hagee and you think that God is going to bless you because you bless a Zionist ethnic cleansing, murderous, genocidal regime, well, God doesn't bless you for that. He condemns you for that. You're not following Jesus Christ. You're not following the apostles because Paul writes three chapters on this very subject. And it's very clear that people that do what Israel is doing today, the state, the Zionist state is doing, are not God's people at all. And if you think they are, well, you're very, if you're a Christian, you're an extremely ignorant Christian. And you're not following the Spirit of God at all either. So that disqualifies you from using the name Christian. So that's my position. That's my position. And as far as the Israeli foreign minister, you're either with Israel or with Hamas, I'm not with Israel. If you want to say I'm with the Hamas, that's up to you. But I'm not with Israel. No way. No way, Jose. Am I going to justify... Genocide, and this is nothing but genocide. You know, we thought we were done with this stuff. We fought a world war to end these kind of things in Japan and in Germany and to a lesser degree in Italy. The Axis powers. They were all racial supremacists. They were all murderers. They all engaged in ethnic cleansing especially uh, the Germans and the Japanese. Unacceptable. Unacceptable in the sight of God. God does not approve of any of this. He hates it. And those who practice these things will incur his eternal wrath. Well, that's where I stand after a month of this stuff. It must end. And the American government, uh, Biden, is complicit in this and shares in the blood. This means shed. And judgment 
will come upon the bloody regime in the Palestine, the Israeli regime, and upon the United States of America again. Judgment is coming. 